So I'll first start with, um, how are you feeling now? I'm feeling great. I'm excited about life. I'm happy to be out. And when, um, when you were convicted, um, how tough was that for you to bear going to prison and knowing that you were going to be stuck there for something you didn't do? Uh, it was scary, but at the same time, I, I, I've always been hopeful from the very beginning. I, 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 knowing that, some, that, this, that I didn't do it, I knew that something had to happen in my trial to go wrong, and I just needed to find out what that was. What was going through your mind when you read and heard the judge okay. throw out the murder conviction? Well, he kind of strung it out for a while before he came to, you know, announce that decision. So I was, I was terrified, but I, I was, I was hopeful as, as well. I, I, I knew that if it got before a fair judge, and he was open-minded, I, I was sure that they would see the truth, and that whoever he was he would arrive at the right decision. Do you think the investigators originally had it out for you in some way? I know that, you know, in, in my neighborhood, as like in a lot of neighborhoods during that time, uh, there are certain people that the police, when things happen in that neighborhood or in the, or those neighborhoods, they would round up as usual suspects, I would call them. and I probably became one of those. When you were in prison, how did you keep going and keep fighting to get to the truth? Well, the first thing I did was get a job in the library. I started out as a file clerk, and then I moved on to become a, a law clerk. I read as many books as I could about the law. I invested in a lot of books to know more about the law. And then I came across a book that was, uh, was called The Investigator's Handbook, and it taught me how to get records from different law enforcement agencies. And that was the start of discovering a lot of the evidence uh, that was eventually found in my case. Okay. Um, so when you had exhausted every measure possible, um, what did you do to try and show them that you were innocent? That fight was a long fight, right? Yeah, that was the problem. I, I presented what I had at the time, which included confessions from the actual people that did it, admissions from the only eyewitness, uh, letters, correspondence from, well, it wasn't actually correspondence. I didn't get that until later. But it was information about the jailhouse informant that showed that he had a history of doing this, that he had lied. And, uh, in other cases, and so I thought for sure it was enough to get a court to at least grant me a hearing. Unfortunately, it didn't. And you know, once you go through the round of appeals, everything after that, sometimes the court tend to think that you're just harassing the court. You just don't want to accept a final opinion, and that wasn't the case. I just hadn't had an opinion. I hadn't had a, a, a written reason saying why we don't believe this evidence or why it doesn't entitle you to relief. And so that's what I, I was faced with after I went through that first round of appeals. Um, let's see. Do you feel like the justice system failed you for all that time that you spent in prison? Yes, it, it, it fails until it, it doesn't. And so every time when I file an appeal and I don't get the right decision or I don't get a decision, that is a failure. And so uh, those are areas that I think that need to be looked at again because it not, and that doesn't just happen in my case. I believe that happens across the country. Let's see here. I'm trying to go through my questions. Um, so I know that you testified um, you know, there was, you obviously had a criminal past. That's right. How did you kind of get past that and try to show them, you know, listen, I've changed, I didn't do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that was probably something tough for them to kind of wrap their minds around in court, right? Well, that was one of the things that I feared. I was afraid that these, like I said, you get rounded up during that time period and 
I was afraid that that was going to be a distraction or, you know, may, maybe make the person who was making the decision I don't want to say prejudice, but just, you know, you, you, sometimes you just say this, this person probably deserved to be there. I'm not saying that that's how he felt or would, would feel that way, but that's always a fear. And I didn't want that to be a distraction. I want a person to see the facts for what they were. And I, I, again, I believe that if a person could do that, then they would, re, they would see what happened in this case. Do you feel because of your past, they may have had a tainted opinion of you going into it? Who exactly does? The, the prosecutors, the, you know, the judge, the jury, any of those people who were... I don't know. I mean, those are questions that they would have to answer. So I, I don't know. Uh, I... Do you feel like you were robbed of some of the most important years of your life? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, presence matters more than presence. And so I think that families would rather that person be a part of their life, especially my daughters, uh, to be able to be there with my mother, to be at a place where I could uh, help support them and help her. And, and so I'm just not able to do that because of this time that I've lost, uh, the ability to, to further my education, my job skills. It's just uh, that, was, that was taken from me. Talk about what your life was like before Marcus Boyd was murdered. I, you know, as much as people want to say that I was in the streets and I was making some poor, cho poor choices then, which of course I was, I was not street street. I mean, I was working. I had a full-time job. I was going to school at Forest Park at least twice a week. I had two households I was trying to take care of at the time. And a lot of what was going on at that time, I was just pulled in because of associations. Uh, things that they were involved in. Once you, you know, friends, you're always going to be connected to them. And so I was making that transition that most people make when they finish high school, they go off to college, they start families, and that's where I was at in my life. And I just didn't get a chance to really make the full transition. And when you were kind of felt like you were targeted, from what I understand from the evidence in all of this, why do you think that was? Why do they think they decided that you were the one who was going to go down for this? Again, I think that's a question that they should have to answer. Um, I would really be looking forward to, to, for them to see what they say about that. What's the next step in rebuilding your life now that you are out of prison, that you are back with your family? Hope that uh, I could find a job and, and get out there and grind like everybody else and, and try to get my life back in order and to build some security. I'm 50 years old. And so, uh, you know, even though I worked 30 years for the Department of Corrections for pennies, uh, I don't have a savings, retirement, social security, or anything like that. So. So you're still trying to find a job, a place to live, things like that, that you kind of missed out on? Absolutely, which is unfortunately the, the, the very thing that if I, were, if I was getting out on parole, the state of Missouri would assist me with, but because I'm exoneree and got out, there's nothing in Missouri law that allows for that. So it, it just seems to make little sense to me that Missouri can provide all this assistance, job training, opportunities, housing, even transportation, and employment for parolees, but not for exonerees. So it's a whole different environment for you. It is. Um, because, and, and I don't, you, you aren't eligible for restitution either, are you? No, not at all. That I must think be that, hard to take on. Well, yeah, I mean, just, again, the challenge is of a person that gets out and doesn't have, and is not part of the parole system, he has no support or help. It seems like it's kind of backwards, right? I mean, you spent nearly 28 years in prison, and now there's nothing to help you. Right. I think at the very least it should allow the same uh, assistance that it allows parole, people on parole. When you were in prison for that long, did you start to lose hope after you had exhausted a lot of the legal measures you could take? 
probably my darkest moments was after my habeas, first round of habeas, because I did not know where to go. I was afraid, I didn't want to be one of those prisoners, and there are some, who just continually fight, fall with the court. And so I didn't want to do that. You know, I just, when I filed something, I wanted, I believed, when I filed it, I believed I had a real chance. I believed it was a meritorious p petition that I filed. And so, and so in those cases, I didn't even get a, 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 any reasoning for why those, so that was kind of hard to accept. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I was fortunate that I was in a cell with a, a good friend of mine, Ricky Kidd, who was an exoneree. And he, at that time, was being represented by the Missouri, the Midwest Innocence Project. And he um, basically vouched for me and asked an investigator looking for my case. And that's how the, the Midwest Innocent Project got on board in my case. Wow, okay. So you had made a friend who was able to help you. That's true. And uh, go through the Midwest Innocence Project. Tell me what that process was like. It's a lengthy process because they, they have to do their diligence. They have to check and make sure that uh, especially a lot of the information that I had already obtained was actually accurate and true. So they had to go through that process. and. As it should be, you know, it, it, resources are limited, and they want to make sure that who they get behind is actually innocent, or didn't at least didn't receive a fair trial. And in my case, there was both, you know. And so, once there, there's a stage process that uh, where there's a, I can't really explain it, but I know there's an investigatory and a litigatory stage, litigation stage, and I had to go through all of that three times actually. My case is actually because they had staff turnovers. They had three different directors. So my case was investigated three separate times by three different directors before I even got to the part where I was close to getting investigation stage, I mean, a litigation stage. And so there also had to be a law passed to allow <laughs> a, a hearing to happen. Right. I mean, that's just amazing that you know, people felt so strongly about your case to, to support legislation right. to, to move this forward for you. Without it, I don't know, where, where would you be? Uh, probably, I don't know, probably still inside. Um, and I'm, I, I'm very grateful to the Missouri legislature for stepping up and for the governor for signing that. Uh, that, that it, and it wasn't just something that helped me. It was something that, that there was a hole in the system that needed to be Fixed, and they saw that, and they they changed it. And so, as much as we want to criticize, they definitely d deserve credit for that. It seems like you did have a lot of support from your family, right? The community, people. Yes, I'm extremely grateful to them. For you. Extremely grateful to them too, uh, especially a lot of them who braved the cold and the heat, standing in front of the courthouses and, and standing in front of the, the unfortunate attorney general's office, just asking for an opportunity to be heard. They, they, I'm indebted to them, and I'm grateful to them. Do you hope that because this hole has been filled kind of in the system, that more people who are innocent, who are, were in your position or still are, mm -hmm. will have the opportunity to be heard once again? I am hopeful, but unfortunately, if we continue to have the type of opposition as we had with my case and Strickland's case, then it's just going to be a very difficult process and, and maybe even discouraging to some prosecutors. And Missouri deserves better. Uh, it, it, prosecutors, if they are just as they are capable of saying this person is guilty and taking that person to trial, they are also capable of assessing a case and saying, hey, a mistake was made, and, 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 and that should be respected. That, that, because it's, it's the same process. You, before they take a case to trial, they have to believe in it. They have to look at the evidence and say whether they, you know, and if they're capable of doing it before trial, they certainly should be able to be capable of doing it after trial. And talking about your family and their support, did they come visit you in prison and, you know, were they really there for you as you struggled with this? They were. They were. They were there the best that they could be and uh, I'm extremely grateful to my family. 
I'm grateful that my daughters wanted to be a part of my life. I am, my, my daughter's mothers deserve a lot of credit for raising them the way that they did without me being there. And so, yeah, I, I, was, I was fortunate in that, that sense. Your daughter tells me that she's getting married soon. Yes, she and, is. And <laughs> um, you're going to be able to walk her down the aisle. Yes. Is that something that you thought would ever ha really happen? I didn't know. I did not know. I, uh, the, the gentleman that she's marrying, I did get to meet him, and he's fine, and uh, he's traditional. He came and told me that he wanted to do this, and so I was... Uh, very honored that he saw some value in that and, and thought enough of me to do that. And so to be able to pass, you know, I, I know this is not politically correct, but to be able to give my daughter away, I would, I would just to be there would be more than, more than anything I can ever describe. So, yeah. And that's coming up soon, right? That's coming up soon, next couple of months. Man. <laughs> and. Is there th some things you missed out on with your daughter? I mean, wasn't she just a, a baby when you went to prison? Yeah, yeah, she was like two months. And, you know, I, I, think, I think there is a certain connection between a, a father and daughter, just as there is between a mother and a son. And that closeness, uh, you know, it's hard to get over the telephone or in, for a couple of hours in a visiting room. So yeah, I missed, missed out on that. And um, especially the influence that I would have had on my daughters because women are said to pick men who mirror their fathers. And so uh, I would want my daughter, she, I, well, I'm not saying that she didn't choose well, she did, so I'm, I'm happy about that. But there is a sense of closeness that she didn't get from me. And uh, I, I missed that. So did you just have one daughter, or did you? I have two. You have two. Yeah. Okay. So one is twenty-eight, the other is twenty-nine. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then your other daughter was born while you were in prison already. Then. Yeah, she was already. No, I was already out. You were out. All right. Okay. The, the youngest was uh, for tw was two months. The other was about a year. Oh, already. okay. Okay. Yeah. So you still did miss both a lot of things in both of their lives. I did. I did. Yeah. How hard is that? That you know. You miss their first words, steps, things like that, right? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Those small things, those memorable things. Uh, yeah, that's that's something that we can't ever get back, can't ever be replaced. When you were in prison, was there a time when people, you know, didn't believe you when you said you were innocent? <laughs> Well, I didn't do a lot. Well, I, I, I talked to select people. I mean, it's not something to just run around telling people. Usually the people that, that I associated with were people who had a similar experience, like Ricky, like my friend Ricky Kidd. That's why we connected so well, because our life experiences is so similar. The only real difference is that he was on one side of the state and I was on the other. And so I surrounded myself with people that I could discuss law with, that I could rely on for moral support, and we you know, that's how we got through. Let's see. Let me see what else I am missing here. Um, going back to kind of some of the community support, did the community fighting for you on the outside really make a big difference? I believe so. I believe you need all of that, all, all types of fr fights on each front to get change. You know, and having people out there rallying and calling for just an opportunity to be heard, it lets the, the people who they've empowered know that this is an important issue. And so, yeah, they, they, they were very impactful. What was your nearly 30-year fight to be free like for you? I mean, there was probably a lot that went on there. It's fear. I've, I've, I've said this before, is that it doesn't get better. You know, as a person, when they, when they get arrested, you think, okay, the, the, the right thing's going to happen. 
that doesn't happen. Then you get indicted, and then you get uh, you go to trial, and you get, then you think, okay, the appeal is going to work, and then you think, no, the federal habe is going to work. Then you think the state habe, and so it's, it's just a train that's going down the road, and it and it does not get better with each denial. And the longer it get, it takes, the more it tends to affect your your, your hope and belief in the system. If the courts had gotten it right the first time, what do you think your life would be like? I believe I would have made the choices that a lot of people make. I think all, everybody, or I don't think anybody, I, I, would, I, I shouldn't say that because I don't know. But I, I don't think all of us are happy with who we were in our 20s. I mean, it, those, those years, are the, you know, the early, late, early, uh, teens and eight, the late teens and early 20s, that's where you're supposed to make mistakes. You're expected to make mistakes because it's from there that you, 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 you get, gain experience and wisdom. And so whatever mistakes I was making, thing, I, I would have grown out of those just like everybody else would have. And I would have gone on to um, go to, you know, finish school, get a job, a career, and, and go on with my life with you know, marriage and so on and so forth. How did it feel after you were let out of the holding area? We were all there. Mm -hmm. That was probably really intimidating, but how did it feel to see your family outside of a, a prison or a courthouse? Oh, it was, um, I can't even begin to explain. I mean, it was so, it was, I, I think I said it was overwhelming. I wasn't expecting that big of a crowd of people. I thought maybe six, six or seven people maybe. So, um, you know, I think back, maybe I would have done things differently. I would have definitely tried to address the people there, the people that were supporting me better, but I just, I, I, didn't, I didn't, I was, from the, from the decision to that, to just being into the world, it was just, it was more than I could take at the time. Yeah. and. A lot to process. It is. Yeah. And being able to hug your family and, right. you know, in a more comfortable setting, you know, starting your life over, I mean, that was probably more than you could ask for. Yeah, because in the visiting room, you only, you only allowed a brief, two to brief, brief hug and, uh, and kiss. So you get two to three seconds for that. And so to be able to really hug the people that you love and care about, uh, that. It's, it, it matters more than anything. Let's see. We talked about some of that already, but a lot of your time spent in prison was trying to figure out how you could really show you were innocent, right? It was all about trying to let the truth be known. That's true. Everything that I did, I kept a record of it. It was turned over to the Attorney General's office because I wanted them to, to see that, that there, there wasn't anything that I was doing that was not appropriate. And so that's why they had the things that they had to, to score whatever points that they could make during the hearing because we turned over all our evidence, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And unfortunately, I didn't get that chance when I went to trial to fully test the case because a lot of what I should have had was not turned over and that the jury was, uh, should have been entitled, were, were entitled to have and consider when making a decision on my life. And so it just shows the contrast of, you know, what, well, I don't, what I did and what my legal team did and what the state unfortunately didn't do. Do you feel like the jury at the time when they were deciding what to do at the end really had all the information then. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and we was living in different times then. Then I think we all believed that, you know, police officers were always honest and acting in good faith. And today, especially with video cameras and things, we, we know now that that's not always the case. And so I think there was just different times. I think juries now would be a lot they would demand more from, from officials than back then because now we know a little better. And again, that's not to say that officers, all officers are, are bad. That's not at all. In fact, 
the, one of the men that my daughter is uh, marrying is an officer, and so I have a lot of respect for police officers. So. Do you feel like now that the justice system righted a horrendous wrong in your case? Absolutely. I think I w if there's anything unique about my situation, it would be that this allowed people to see what commonly happens in a lot of cases, because all of the, all of what we know to have to be to, to the causes wrongful convictions happen in my case. You've got jailhouse informant, ineffective counsel. You have, you know evidence not being turned over, all those things are red flags, things that have been studied that have been said to say this is what generally causes um, wrongful conviction and all of that is in my case. Is there anything you want to say to the people that ended up sending you to prison, the, you know, the police officers, the investigators, the lawyers who ended up sending you to prison? I, I, I don't believe in hating anyone because uh, that's, that's just imprisoning yourself again and I'm not, you know, I, I, 28 years is enough. I don't need a more, another mental prison trying to hold on to hate. I'm just happy that uh, justice was served here and that I have an opportunity to try to better my life and, and add to whatever I can to the, to the world, and that's where I'm focused on. Do you think that this is really the start of your life now? That's the good thing. One thing I can say about prison, it allows you to begin again. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah I, I, this is a, a start for me, and, I, 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 and I'm going to represent who I am. And that's just a person who's, who's want to do good in the world and want to help other people, especially the youth. You know, I don't want them to follow the same path that myself and so many other people have, have fallen in because there are a lot of men in prison who, I was their age. And going, when, you know, the wait for this, after the hearing, I stayed at the Justice Center. And it is heartbreaking to know that a lot of the mentality and the, and the thoughts then still that you know it was 30 years ago when I was in the city it still is prevalent today the ideal about the system and the going to trial you're going to get a reversal you can get a time back a lot of them have no idea what happens after that trial and how difficult that process is and I think that there was purpose in this pain and that allows me to be able to talk to the youth and say hey you know the, the lifestyle the things that you believe it's not true, and I, I've lived it. I know it. You can't tell me that I don't know it. I don't. I've, you know, I'm not some square that you know you can say. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I know it, and people like my friend Ricky Kidd, other exonerees like Larry Callanan, uh, uh, Mike Pleat. We I can go down the line of exonerees who have a lot to contribute. And a lot, all of us have different, a lot of us have different life experiences, so there's no youth that we can't touch. Is there something you would say to maybe a young man who is, was kind of in your situation or is kind of in your situation that you were in then, you know, that was kind of trying to make ends meet and maybe not making the best choices? What would you say to a young man like that? I would tell him that there's no right way to do wrong. And that you have to weigh everything by what it's gonna cost you. And it's, and, and the people who are gonna be hurt most are the people that love you and that are dependent upon you. And they would much rather, they put, put more value on your presence than they would on your presence. And so, just stop stop and, and, and work hard like everybody else. We've seen a lot of uh, young teens, young girls, young boys committing a lot of crimes here in St. Louis right. and 
it's kind of tough to see and it's it's hard to think that um, people are kind of throwing it away essentially I mean because you would probably give anything to have all those years back oh anything I would you could I would there's no amount of money you can pay me to go through what I went through for the last 28 years, what I've experienced, uh, what I've lost. Uh, there's nothing, and I'm sure every exoneree would tell you the same thing. There is nothing that can replace just being freedom. Nothing that can replace that. Talking about something more fun, okay. what are some things that you are looking forward to doing? Because it's a whole different world now for you, right? I know. I. I, it, it may seem cliche, but, uh, or just, you know, you know, people like, oh, but, you know, I keep saying it, I don't have a destination. I just want to get on a plane. I want to see that ocean. I want to stick my toes in the sand and uh, ride a horse. I mean, anything that's a go, I'm willing to go. Anything that, that's, that's possible, I want to go and do it and experience it. Anything in particular that you're especially looking forward to or a meal that you're like, I can't wait to have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to, to eating better, to working out. You know, there's so much that's so limited on the inside. Uh, I want to run and um, do marathons, do um, uh, triathlons. I want to do those mud races. Um, I want, I mean, I could go down, the, I know it, I just, I, I don't know what I want to do. I just know I want to do everything. I'm <laughs> sorry, I just do. Because I haven't had an opportunity to do anything. I've never been outside of St. Louis. And so if anybody has any ideas that this guy needs to be able to do that, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to go on that. So there's probably a lot of things you still have to learn then. Absolutely. I still haven't figured out the, the phones. And I can't, I don't understand how people are able to do that so fast, the texting and... Uh, the navigation of the, but uh, I'm I'm trying to learn. Because you didn't have any of this when you. No, when I left, there were pages. There was pages. You know what a page is? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there were pagers. You probably didn't have a cell phone. No, I didn't have a cell phone. No. Nope. Mm -hmm. And these pages, they didn't have. They didn't even have the. I think that was probably the beginning stages of because you could get messages on some pages. I, that, that hadn't even been when I was out there, so. Yeah. What was something that shocked you when you, in these last few days that you've gotten out of, out of prison? The shape of the cars, <laughs> the navigation in the cars, how you can use your cell phone to turn on music in the car, and, and Siri is really driving me crazy. <laughs> I'm scared of her, <laughs> whoever that is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it seems like you can say well, anything to her and she's, she knows exactly what you're talking about. So um, that is, that's crazy. Artificial intelligence. I don't know. I mean, I maybe I don't, I mean, I don't even know. I don't know. But <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> and, you know, some people might say, well, some of the hardest part of your life is over. But it's still just as hard leaving that prison cell and leaving, you know, something that you knew for 28 years. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like going inside of a prison because you have those same fears and you don't know what to expect. And I don't know what to expect, but I'm, I'm not afraid of finding out. You know, I, I, I have to do it. Same way you inside when you go through there and you get convicted and you're sentenced and they, you show up at the door, you have to go through it. And I have to go through this and I'm, I'm ready. Are you worried people are still going to see you as the thing you went to prison for? No, I don't. I'm not worried about that. And now, you know, moving forward, are you just more excited about, you know, living life and going out there and being with your family on holidays? And Absolutely. Yeah, I would. When you say holidays, I'll... I want to go to a haunted house. I want to be chased around by some monsters or something. <laughs> you know? It's interesting you say that because um, Halloween was kind of when this happened, right? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I lost a great, a good, good friend then. 
that's something people may not realize. Um, Marcus Boyd was your friend. He was. He was a good friend of mine. And, you know, like most friendships at that age, you, you, you drift apart. It was not never an argument, a problem, or anything like that. It was just he was busy, you know, attending to his family, and I was busy attending to mine. So what do you hope happens now? I hope that, I hope for a lot. I hope that I'm allowed to, or able to go on with my life, uh, rebuild my, or strengthen my relationships with my family. I'm hopeful that, you know, I'll be able to, you know, build some security and, and, and I can, be okay, much like everybody else. I hope that people can look at my situation and learn from it. I hope that, you know, I think those things are there that, well, yeah, it just boils down to learning and just being able to go on with life. And I, I wish that for everybody. I wish that for everybody. What do you say to the people who still think that um, you committed this crime? I know they're entitled to, to feel the way that they feel. Um, I would invite them to just look at the case and look at the facts. And beyond that, I, there's nothing I can do. Uh, I never wanted to be arrested for that. I always told, you know, the, the, everybody that I could where I was, you know, that I had no reason to do this. I encouraged them to find whomever had information about the case. And I, you know, I was fortunate that those who had information about the case came forward. They had the courage to come forward, and it's, that's not more. It's, I don't know much more I can do than that. Than that. For maybe people who did not, you know, listen in during the hearing or didn't hear it from you, is there anything you want to say now to tell people you're innocent and you didn't do this? Again, I don't know what more I can say. I mean, that, that hearing was very open. I don't think a lot of the stuff that that was heard would be something that a jury would hear, get to hear. But, you know, the courts, they trust judges to be able to distinct, you know, to separate admissible evidence from inadmissible evidence. So it was raw, it, everything was there. You know, it was like, again, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And this judge was, he, he was, very experienced. He's been on the bench for over 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. He's not a soft judge. And so, you know, I think it says a lot for him to be able to reach the decision he did. And I think, I think that's respect that people know Judge Mason. And I'm extremely grateful to him for just being open. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell people now, you know, again, you didn't do this, that you were innocent? I did not do this. I did not do this. I loved Marcus. He was a good friend of mine. He was there for me. We were there for each other at difficult times in our life, and I'll always hold on to that. Another thing is you, you again, you lost a friend, and, and you had to deal with that while being blamed for for killing him. I did. I did. Yeah. That must have been so hard. It is. You know, and you don't really get a chance to grieve because you have to fight for your own life. Yeah. So over this time, you know, did you get a chance to grieve and, you know, tell his family that Well, there was a time when I met Trisha Bushnell. She, she's the last one who remember that Eminence's project <clears throat> had three different directors. And so when she came on, you know, she was getting acquainted with the cases that they had, and mine came up, so she had to do the reinvestigation. And when she visited me, she asked me to go over everything, and I'll never forget that how I started talking to her, and I don't know, I just couldn't stop it was got really emotional, and I was talking about Marcus, and it just, I couldn't explain it. 
and and I think she kind of explained to me that maybe it was just that uh, I hadn't had opportunity to really allow that to come out to release. And so that was probably the time that I really started to, to, to grieve, you know, so, yeah. So in a way, this has been good for you to let some of this go that you yes. were holding on to. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything you want to say to the community and all the people that were here and supported you, your family? Just that I am very grateful to them, and I appreciate them standing up and, you know, just asking those who we've empowered, the public officials, to just do the right thing, not just for me, but for everybody. And I think we all deserve that because how you treat one is how you can treat another. And it doesn't matter what our backgrounds is, what our race is, it matters. We all should care about how public officials respond to claims of innocence and, 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 and the process of a trial. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or anything else that you wanted to say? No, thank you, for, thank you. For, for this. And I'm sorry we were late. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. okay. Um, I did want to show you, um, since I know you said you didn't have a... So I guess this is the page that you were reading in the courtroom, mm -hmm. right? This is, yeah, this is what he read, and I, yeah, this is what I looked to it. Because when it was passed to the, to well, it, anybody who studies law and get opinions, you always go to the back because the courts are going to say yay or nay, and that, you just, that just happens by habit. And not only did he say, you know, that there's constitutional error, but that I was actually innocent, and so that really mattered to me. Who knew that a 46-page document with a few <laughs> words on the back could uh, mean so much? Change a life. Change a life. That's true. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, that moment must have been really amazing for you. It really was. It really was. It, it took me a while to, to process it, actually. I mean, yeah, looking at you can see that I just... Uh, yeah, it's just a, like a weight that was lifted off of me. It really, it was, yeah, I can't even describe it. Everybody cheering for you was probably pretty amazing. It really was.